Strange Days, the 1995 movie review and thoughts. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I mostly loved. This video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities, and I will get into some serious topics. Now, if you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, before I go further, the top link in the description box will allow you to donate to the SAG After Strikers. Please do so, it's an extremely important cause. And then there are some links to videos that help explain why this is such an important cause. So, I start the video with a review where if I... I'm, I'm probably not going to be spoiling anything. If I do decide to spoil something, I will verbally warn before I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. So you can mute and skip ahead until you see lower until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself and get into the thought sections, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So this movie is rated R uh, with, uh, you know, the, yeah, the IMDb Parents Guide gives a severe rating to sex and nudity, violence and gore, profanity and frightening and intense scenes. A moderate to alcohol, drugs, and smoking. Yeah, that is about the only thing that it doesn't... Yeah, it definitely is... You know, if any of that bothers you, you're probably not gonna want to watch the movie. If any of that, like, is your kind of thing, I wouldn't say there's, like, as much here of any of it as you could easily find in other movies from the time. I do think that at least some of it would probably... I, I definitely think the, the sexual violence should have at the very least been, been significantly trimmed down. But it definitely is the kind of movie that, you know, the, the 90s movies like this were still rated R. You know, the... the the PG-13 rating has not had its reign of terror begin yet. You know, yeah, and and it it definitely gets some more grit from the the R rating. It it would not feel as real if they had tried to make it PG-13. So, yeah, if if it had been made, let's see, maybe ten years later. Maybe even less than that. Eight, eight years later, it was like, I guess the first, when I think of like PG-13, SWAT from 2003 might be the first movie that comes to mind that's like, that would have been an R rating if it had been made just a little bit prior. That, that movie doesn't need to be an R rating, but it is kind of silly that something with that much violence, like there's there's not that much like really graphic violence, but it is about like, a SWAT team fighting gang violence, you know, it's not really... Some movies, it's fine to have an R rating, uh, to have a PG-13 rating. Anyway, the... Um, let's see, I am not 100% certain how many times I've watched this. This was at least my second viewing. I watched it... Uh, I have it right here. I watched it back in 2005. That was the first uh, viewing. I think I watched it more than once back then, but I honestly don't remember. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and yes, the, the most recent viewing for me was just a few minutes ago. I literally, as soon as the credits were done rolling, I hit record. And yeah, so the plot... I'm mean, quoting IMDb here. A former cop turned street hustler accidentally uncovers a conspiracy in Los Angeles in 1999. It is the eve of the dawn of the new millennium, and we are not okay. We are very not okay. Now, this was written by James Cameron and... Jay Cox. I guess I'll briefly... I don't know very much about Jay Cox. Um, 
I mean, yeah, he, he wrote the screenplay and story for Gangs of New York. He wasn't the only one, but he was one of them. I think that one's quite well written. Uh, let's see. Oh, right, right, yeah. He did, he did rewrites for Star Wars A New Hope and Titanic. He did script re revisions, though he went uncredited. And, yeah, there's two upcoming, The Last of the Savages and A Complete Unknown. The most recent thing he wrote is from 2016. There was a gap between 2004 and 2016, but, yeah, um, I think he did, he's, he's done pretty well in, in each of these. James Cameron, I'm significantly more familiar with, and... Yeah, I will I will get more into so the the plot twists are pretty significant to this movie. This is very much a movie that wants you to try to figure out where it's going to go. I personally think they they do pretty well. There are not too many plot twists. I didn't really think any of them were bad, though I certainly think they could have been rewritten to be better. Uh, there are not too few, though there's probably... I did. It's not really an issue of there being too few plot twists, as much as the movie overall being over long. But there are chunks of the movie where there's not really any new plot twists, there's not that much, like, there's character development, there's always something happening, but for, like, a mystery, you know, like, if, yeah, very early on, it sets up a mystery. I don't know if I'm going to give away exactly what the mystery is, but just something happens, and we're left wondering, why? What's going on here? And the, considering that, it's, it's striking that there are chunks of the movie where nothing new is really learned. Like, no, no major piece of information is, is learned. Uh, and and the, the sci-fi element, you know, the fact that they have to do world building, I guess not, not it's, it's not that it is in conflict with the, the unraveling of the conspiracy so much as it could have been made part of it. You know, each time we get some world building, it could have, and some of the time it does, lead to new information that helps us uncover what's going, you know, the, the viewer and the characters. And it's not one of those movies that falls apart once you learn the twist. Now, yes, so the, the um, a brief ranking of the, the, um, so the, the James Cameron, I've watched all except Expedition Bismarck, Last Mysteries of the Titanic, Years of Living Dangerously, James Cameron's Story of Science Fiction. Those are the only ones I haven't, that, that he's either written or, or directed. And yeah, so, so the three that he wrote that he didn't direct, worst to best, you know, I'm... I'm going to update this ranking at the end of this video, at the end of the review section of this video, with where I put this movie, Strange Days. But the other three, worst to best, Dark Fate, Rambo 2, and Alita. And the ones he directed, regardless of writer, keeping in mind, other than True Lies, I love all of them. They are all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. True Lies, The Abyss, Avatar 1, Avatar 2, Titanic. Terminator 2, Aliens, and Terminator 1. So this movie is definitely... On, in, in some ways, a bit of an outlier for Cameron. You can definitely see, there's, there, you know, he... In, in most of his movies, there is a fascination with technology both in the the filmmaking element uh, with with the POV element of this this film 
and the the also also the the in in the movie there'll be some piece of technology that Cameron shows a very clear fascination with and you know his movies tend to be progressive he's he's clearly at least trying to empathize with minorities this is not the one where he does the best job i would i would definitely say it's it's one of those things where because conservatives a lot of the time are so you know they they really dominate the conversation so sometimes left wingers you know when they're when they're trying when when we on the left try to to argue for you know a left leftist perspective on things because conservatives have so dominated the conversation have set the tone we have to you know basically we have a choice either we can go way to the left of what's been said and you know to a lot of people who haven't heard of these concepts before we're gonna sound like we're not making any sense or we can try to meet them where they're at we can try to talk to them based on how they understand the world and we have to start by just saying okay I know you think that you know this this thing is like this honestly it's more like this you know and this movie definitely suffers from that it is some some have described it as like frenetic as you know I, I feel like this is a movie that is it has aged reasonably well in that regard and at the time it was too much for people similar to how the 1982 the thing you know by today's standards by more recent standards the the body horror is just like effective when at the time it was thought of as excessive you know and and sadly it meant that a lot of people could not concentrate on the that excellently done paranoia you know and i i can understand you know when i first watched it it was too much for me i was probably like 13 so yeah but you know it's one of those things where if you watch it again multiple times you can get more used to it and and be able to focus on other elements and this movie yeah you know it's a, a lot of 90s movies when i sit down to watch them today they feel slow even though i know i know they're not actually slow because i've i watched them in the 90s and at the time i you know they they moved as they should you know but yeah you know movies like this and face off you know they're they're so they're 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 fast paced they're intense in a way that some other 90s movies weren't and yeah it makes them easier to to sit down and watch today it is definitely the most like it's it really is fascinating watching stuff that James Cameron wrote or at least wrote for that he didn't direct because this in some ways doesn't even feel like him like this feels more like if Neville Dean Taylor had made you know it feels like a Neville Dean Taylor film if the cocaine wasn't pure and if there were pretensions of a of a conscience of of a you know sense of social responsibility which in some ways kind of misunderstands the appeal of Neville Dean Taylor you know I'm I'm quite fond of both crank movies and I I am fascinated by gamer it is definitely I can see what they were trying to do. I absolutely can. And certainly the production values are very impressive. It's kind of a mess. Um, I did a video on it. Film Brain did a really excellent video on it. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, but yeah, like this movie, um, 
if there's a scene outside near like the street there's a riot you know if the the yeah there and and if we're not on the street like there's usually like it's not necessarily that someone is having sex but someone is probably watching a recording of someone having had sex one of the pov shots you have this um yeah there are several scenes where where people get roughed up there there are like scenes of of like exes arguing in a in a very very harsh way you know it it's yeah i i 100% understand why in 95 you know like i mentioned earlier the first time i watched it was 10 years later so for me it never quite had the intensity that you know, I, I did watch a lot of 90s movies in the 2000s, but a lot of them d didn't, like, I, I, at the time, I often liked movies that were from the, er from the mid to early 2000s in, in that period. But, you know, movies like this and Face Off, very much my speed. Uh, you know, I, I do appreciate older cinema as well, but when it comes to 90s, yeah. I think that might be about what I had to say for, for that. So, this is very much a cyberpunk, uh, you know, yeah, piece of the, the cyberpunk subgenre, which is why I don't know if it's super easy to tell because they're a little too far away, but I did put the, the William Gibson, I cannot believe I'm blanking on the, the name, um, the trilogy. Uh, hold on. The Sprawl trilogy by William Gibson, aka Neuromancer, uh, hold on. Count Zero, and Mona Lisa Overdrive. I have to admit, it's been like 20 years or something since I read them, but I really loved them at the time, and yeah, I I could probably still sit down and, and read. You know, when I did my video on Johnny Mnemonic, I read that short story, which I think that was the first time I read that short story, but that was also William Gibson, and yeah, quite enjoyed that one, and my video on that is from the 9th of January, 2021, so, you know, For those who might not know, and in case you know some some of you might, so I'm gonna, I'll keep this short and not you know. But basically, the the yeah, cyberpunk. It's this yeah subgenre of science fiction in a dystopian futuristic setting, focused on a combination of low life and high tech. And, you know, yeah, if, yeah, featuring futuristic technological and scientific achievements such as AI, cyberware, juxtaposed with societal collapse, dystopia, or decay. And, yeah, among, you know, other than William Gibson, the, the you know, Philip K. Dick and Harlan Ellison also wrote. And, yeah, very, love their work. Um... It is very much, right, and, and Judge Dredd is also considered cyberpunk. Akira is cyberpunk, both the manga and the anime. Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, which is an adaptation of Philip K. Dick's to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. It, Johnny Mnemonic, the movie, bad as it is. The Matrix trilogy, you know, Alita Battle Angel based on Battle Angel Alita. Um, I haven't played it, but uh, some people really love the, the video game Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, yeah, you know, that's that's basically what we're, we're dealing with here. Now, in this, it's not quite like drug, but it's coded as drug. Like, if you look at the... the um, they call them clips. The, the recording... 
the recording device is called a squid and it makes clips and basically in addition to a POV you know you know to, to the viewer to the viewer of the movie strange days it appears to be a POV shot of someone engaged in some activity that is in some way stim stimulating you know it can be knocking over a liquor store it can be sex you know there's various different but just something that gets the adrenaline pumping you know but it is clear that the people in the movie watching clips they're not just seeing the footage it, you know the the squid goes on top of your head i kind of feel like it would probably have to penetrate to have the effect it does but whatever it's you know we it's fiction the the viewer of a, a clip in the movie actually feels what the person who recorded it felt so that's you know that's how we get into this sort of drug you know it has it's it's not the same you know it's not like just watching a TikTok video or something or, or YouTube you know it is actually it changes how you feel in in a way and you know some people become addicted to it and there are times where the movie very much like it'll show someone who's you know experiencing the the high that the clip brings and it very much looks like the when when you look at like you know yeah it's it looks the way it looks when someone is getting high on on some you know yeah some drug This is the only Bigelow, Catherine Bigelow film I've watched. Yes, I know I should watch others. You know, everyone says, you know, it's especially the ones I especially hear are The Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty. Although Zero Dark Thirty has been interpreted as being, you know, apologism for, for water boring, you know, suggesting that it, you know, delivers credible intel, though apparently. I forget if Bigelow herself, but someone who worked, who who wrote for that movie, said that that was that's a misunderstanding of what they were trying to do. Now the right, so so my Blu-ray has a three-minute theatrical trailer, a seven-minute behind the scenes that's quite informational, and I have to admit I ended up not counting, but thirty or forty minutes of commentary you know and and apparently she did not you know Bigelow did not do it by herself in a sound booth but in front of a crowd so it's impressive that she's able to do it so calmly and it does mean that we're able to hear crowd reactions like laughter you know she's good she works that crowd and she gets into a lot of detail especially about POV shots and I'm not 100% certain but I kind of get the sense that originally like they showed the opening POV sequence uh, which is uh, you know yeah several minutes it's very impressive and after having showed that they they you know she got up in front of the crowd and explained this stuff for you know maybe 30 minutes and it was recorded and then put on the DVD and kind of treated as if it was you know commentary on the main film but you know and and based on some of what she says it sounds like they might have maybe they showed the video but not all but did not play audio of the the opening so that she could point to and say when we you know to do this we had to do this you know but yeah it is it is good and certainly I consider it more you know, it's it's more engaging to to have it play as audio during the first. You know, it it doesn't play during the POV sequence, but it starts right after that and plays for thirty or forty minutes. I didn't note the exact time because I thought it was gonna be 
you know, it's on on the on the cover. It says feature commentary. So, but yeah, you know, it it works well as playing over the the film. And yeah, so some of what they they say in in these extras, they had to design a specific camera to make the POV shots work. There was also a lot of rehearsal and planning that went into it, since of course they did not back then have high quality video cameras that were small enough for a person to wear and like perform chases in. And let's see, so so yeah, um, the movie does sadly play into some of the tropes that were popular at the time to an extent still are the idea that black people are more violent, women are more emotional and irrational. But at least the black characters and some of the women do get some really cool, meaningful moments instead of just being made out to look terrible, as is often the case when these tropes are played straight. And, you know, unfortunately some of the black characters are of interest to the movie only in how they may be either a threat or a boon to white people, which... Boy, is that very, very telling about how a lot of white people view black people. Like, if you're upset about that, like, if you're a white American, it was your ancestors who took the, you know, who, who kidnapped a bunch of Africans and forced them into slavery. So, you know, if you're unhappy about there being so many descendants of slaves, don't be angry at the descendants of slaves, be angry at your own ancestors. And it is, of course, also, you know, the idea that black people are more violent, it was slavers who were violent to slaves. You know, they, they beat them, they raped them. So, yeah, the, you know, if anyone's violent, it's, it's the white people who had anything to do with slavery. And, you know, a lot of conservatives spreading these lies about black people today and ever since, you know, yeah, during slavery as well, and since it ended, is in order to make, you know, if if you think that black people are violent, and then you encounter a black person who says, no, I've been the target of violence, you know, you're, you're, like, you are set up to not believe them. You know, th thankfully, the, the, you know, I'm not certainly it also does a lot of harm, but social media, including YouTube, has given a lot of black people a voice. Uh, now, let's see, and yeah, you know the the you know some of the women in in the film primarily exist in relation to white male characters to to own or to protect, like the abyss and. By far the worst example to relies, this one gets nowhere near as bad as that. This is one of those movies that Cameron wrote that was him working through some frustration with women, and it's very obnoxious. I'm not saying that he can, you know, that I only like it when his female characters are Sarah Connor, Ellen Ripley, or Neytiri, but just... I feel like there's a happy middle ground. It doesn't have to be this bad. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits what came before. I, I think the ending is, is quite good, and honestly, the last chunk of the movie is some of the best. I, I wish more of the movie had that kind of focus. And let's see. So the the characters. Ray Fiennes plays Lenny Nero, a former vice cop who is now selling clips. And you know, it's it's fairly straightforward, tropey kind of you know. He's a, a white dude who is in need of redemption. I really wish this movie that is in part about black pain was not centered on whether or not he gets redemption. But, yeah. You know, there was, there was definitely a fear that if they didn't do that, 
a lot of white America would not watch the movie and it would be a box office flop, which ultimately it still was. Now, Angela Bassett plays Lornette Mace Mason, and she's basically this limo driver. She's, she's a friend of, of Lenny, and it is fairly one-sided. She, she calls him out for, you know, he needs favors from her and sometimes even tries to pay but he doesn't really do anything to, to help her. And she is perhaps the most compelling character. She's she's one of she gets a number of the best lines and just her what's the word? Yeah, she's, she is actually an interesting character. There's something going on with her that is not... How do I say this without spoiling? Yeah, uh, I think I've given as much detail as I can without spoiling. Juliette Lewis plays Faith Justin, and... You know, I am not alone in the feeling that during the 90s, Juliette Lewis was just about impossible to take your eyes off. You know, she's great in Cape Fear and From Dusk Till Dawn. She is amazing in Natural Born Killers. You know, and, and this is actually the... the um, what's it called? The oh, sorry, you did that. Hold on, there we go. Um, the the she she had she um. Let's see. Yeah, uh, she she had a band at least, and you can understand why she, you know, she sings some in this, and she really is amazing. It's you know, fantastic voice. This movie really does not have, like she she really sells it best she can. The movie doesn't really have very much like for her to, to chew on. She makes the most of what she has given. And it's also, you know, she was... A lot of her screen time in this, she is, you know, partially undressed at least. And this was a time when that was still seen as something that like, well, you know, you'll never have a career where you play something like what's the word you'll never be respected kind of thing you know thankfully today it is possible you know there there are actresses who have you know gone more or less nude on camera who are still respected it's you know gradually being seen as you know it's 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 baffling that it took this long, but finally people are starting to, to acknowledge, you know, nudity and sexuality, that's just another aspect of life. You can, you can say things in films with that that you simply can't without. You know, and this is something, for example, the Marvel Netflix shows I, I thought did really excellent at using scenes of sexuality to actually convey something to to say this is where that character is in you know headspace this is where these characters relationship is and, and stuff like that but this movie not really i think the idea is to make it seem more like she's someone who needs to be rescued which 
yeah, really, really obnoxious. And yeah, um, Tom Sizemore plays Max. How do you, uh, uh, Tom Sizemore, R.I.P. plays Max Peltier, the a friend of Nero's, and he was also deeply compelling throughout the the nineties. This is not, like, the best, but he seems like he's enjoying himself. Michael Wincott plays Philo Gant. He is the, the, ah, crap. How do you say, I, he, he owns a club that Faith performs in, and the, you know, it's, it's heavily implied that they have a sexual relationship. I don't know if it's supposed to be, Exclusive. I, I don't think Philo is being monogamous with her, at least, but, you know, and, and it's very much coded as him taking advantage of her. Now, Michael Wincott in the 90s played some phenomenal, he wasn't always the central villain, but he was great at playing antagonists, and this really does not do him justice. You know, like, if you're a fan of Michael Wincott, like, watch The Crow, watch... Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, you know, there's there's much, much better. Watch Alien Resurrection if you can get past. It's not the most... I get why people hate it from, from loving at least the first two movies. I, I try to watch it just as, like, a parody. And for that, I it, it works quite well. It is very well produced and well acted. Now... Um, let's see, I think that is going to do it for the characters. Now, so yeah, the, the dialogue can get fairly hand-holdy, you know, James Cameron does not always trust his audience to be able to figure something out if he doesn't just have someone say you know, what a thing is supposed to, yeah. And the, the, you know, it, it does not require as much exposition as the first Terminator. And for, for that movie, he very wisely, like, basically, and this is something Michael Bean has, called, you know, pointed out as well, very frequently, when exposition is being delivered in that movie, they're, you know, the, the characters, both listening to the exposition and the one delivering the exposition, are in some sort of danger. Maybe there's a chase going on, or they are hiding and, and worried about getting caught and killed. This movie sometimes we are literally just watching people talk and like if it was not so mired in these negative tropes it would be so much more like it, it could easily be much more compelling it's also one of those movies that like it is IMDb does not list it as an action film. It's it's listed as crime drama sci-fi. And those do make sense. But it's one of those movies that occasionally there's these glimpses of the action movie that it could be. And like Catherine Bigelow I I I'm not sure I would say that any part of this feels like she's just phoning it in, but she definitely like she clearly really really enjoys the, the action direction, you know, the, the movie really, really comes alive in those. Like, there's, there's action movies where the action just kind of feels like, oh, well, you know, it's been X amount of minutes, we better have an action scene. You know, the... the yeah, um, totally different movie, but one example would be the remake of Get Carter, which is garbage you know this movie no the the action like honestly I I don't think it was like 
the fact that that James Cameron, you know, J James Cameron and Catherine Bigelow were married for for a while, um, and let's see, had they split up by this point? Let's see. Yeah, yeah, they yeah they were married um, eighty nine to ninety one, so they were no longer together at this point, but they were. Um, the, you know, they they had been together, so the fact that he wrote it with so few action scenes, which again is very out of character for for him, like I I think this might be you know because I I have watched every fictional movie that he's directed or written for. This is the one with the you know okay so Titanic obviously also has has less but that one isn't an action movie at all you know that one's more of an epic romance disaster film and that one still does have you know what when the certain thing happens that i suppose i won't spoil even though we all know because it's a historical event you know there's yeah there's some some great action there and in this it just if there's there's very little action in this movie which would be fine if not for the fact that it is a movie like very early on it, it's a movie with a looming threat very early in the film we see there are basically riots in the streets the the year 2000 is approaching and yeah you know I don't remember it myself, but apparently humanity kind of lost its mind for a little bit there. You know, this is not the only movie to explore that. The, the you know, it it is also explored in movies like Existence, The Matrix, and uh, right. I hear Dark City. I have not watched that one. Um, I've been warned that if I watch it, I'll never be able to love the first Matrix again, and that's not. I'm not sure. I want to give that up. Um, ah, crap, there's one more, the 13th floor, you know, so, so, yeah, you know, like I said, I hear great things about Dark City. This movie, Strange Days, is not the only movie that deals with the idea of humanity losing our collective minds for the, the transition between the year 1999 and 2000, but it might be the least of them and and once again i do largely love this movie but it actually like from very early on it says there might you know there there is chaos and it might get much worse and then it doesn't have that many action scenes i actually yeah hold on maybe that is it maybe they thought you know as long as we every so often you know the the Nero and Mace will will have to you know drive from one place to another and there's going to be you know this this riot stuff and it's it's very well filmed and edited it's it's you know it is effective but it really does feel like and that's if this movie had been made today it would be much more of an action film you know, it, it would uh, the similar to how the the original Blade Runner, not not like a big action scene. It, it, it certainly the action element is not the focus of that film. The the you know Blade Runner twenty forty nine. It doesn't take over, but there is you know the 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 action is really really great and in some ways more effective than, you know, and, and we do know that Ridley Scott is capable of directing action uh, and, and was in the 80s, you know, so, yeah, um, I think this movie would have been better, and there's a lot of movies that I don't want to be action movies, but the fact that it has just a little bit it really does feel like the the. I th I think that was 
misjudged. And I swear I'm not just saying that because I saw James Cameron's name and, and you know, oh, well, it's definitely going to be an action movie kind of thing. Now, this was shot by Matthew F. Leonetti, who has a total of 90 completed and, and one upcoming credits as cinematographer. And... Yeah, uh, he does really, really well here. There's some, you know, the the obviously the POV cinematography has to be spectacular. Otherwise, like, think about it, you know, t today it's not, you know, but when this first, you know, th this was supposed to make a huge profit at a movie theater. And the entire screen is these POV shots. You know, you can't do, like, careful, you know, in, in some of, uh, you know, some, some James Cameron movies have extremely effective cinematography and editing. You know, The Terminator, Aliens, Terminator 2, you know, some, some phenomenal, and, and here, you know, I realize he didn't, he didn't direct, but he wrote these scenes knowing that they would be POV. You know, you, you'd have to completely rewrite the movie for these sequences to not be POV. And, yeah, the, the, um, they did a really, really great job. Now, uh, yeah, so, so Matthew, in addition to this, let's see, he DP'd Extreme Prejudice, Commando, Hard to Kill, you know, a low down dirty shame. He he DP'd straight some some straight action movies, and yeah, it, it the the cinematography is very effective throughout. It was edited by an uncredited James Cameron and Howard E. Smith, and Howard has forty six credits as editor the the most recent was in 2018 now some let's see some some shorts but a number of feature films and around this same time that's right yeah he also edited the abyss which may well be how he ended up doing doing this as well and before this, for Catherine Bigelow, he edited Point Break, which haven't watched, but I hear, you know, the stuff that works about it really works. And apparently the editing is one of those things. And, yeah, there's some, there's some very, very effective edits. And... And I want to say, I'm going to talk some about the length... I don't think it's the fault of Howard E. Smith. I think it's it's one of those things, like some things James Cameron is amazing at, but there was a while where he could not make a short movie under any circumstances. You know, the the he did amazing on the first Terminator, which, you know, I'm going to be fair, that one was also a limited budget, so maybe he just likes, you know, when he has the money, he wants to make a long movie, you know, but the, the I'm going to get the, the list real quick, the, yeah, so, Aliens in the Abyss, way too long, though, you know, I will acknowledge the the what's it called the um the the theatrical cut of both were, were trimmed down to make them much more yeah Terminator two the I, th I think the theatrical cut is is okay but you know he favors the the longer you know he prefers let's see I I forget if he said, I think it, that's one of the ones where he said, the director's cut is not my director's cut. I wanted it to be even longer. Uh, let's see. Yeah, True Lies. Uh, hold on. How long is that? No, that's right. That one's also really long. Titanic. And you have the, the two Avatar movies. Yeah, just 
dude likes long movies, and a lot of the time he's able to, to fill that time with something. It, it's one of those things... I really don't want to go too hard on Catherine Bigelow. I don't know enough about her, and I, I don't think that, like, based on what I've heard, you know, I hear, like, I, I know some of her movies are not beloved, but when I hear people talk about her, if they say something negative, it tends to be, you know, Hurt Locker is not realistic, which nobody was asking for that. I, I don't... I don't think people realize how like the kind of that kind of job is is cool in in fiction but in real life like I I uh, hold on I I'm afraid I forget the name but an expert you know watched that movie and said that's nothing like what you know what that job is you know we're not we don't act like that you know we don't take risks like that um, and, you know, Zero Dark Thirty, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that's a bad movie. I've just heard, you know, fellow leftists say that movie makes it seem like waterboarding was useful rather than just a tool of revenge. You know, so so I don't want to go, go too hard on her, but it does seem like maybe Cameron, when, when he writes something, it tends to come out best if he also directs it, so... Yeah, I'm gonna briefly go back to so the list of hold on, the the list of stuff that he yeah so so other than this it was Dark Fate Rambo two and Alita Rambo two is also you know yeah maybe maybe it is somewhat down to the the director though Alita I mean Robert Rodriguez has proven in the past he can do amazing yeah. Um, but, but I gotta say with, yeah, so, if Strange Days and Dark Fate, they, you know, they could have been so much better, uh, and I get, I don't blame Cameron for not wanting to direct another Terminator movie, I think he would love for them to stop making them at all, but the, just, yeah, um, Right, so that brings us nicely to filming locations. So this was actually filmed various parts of California, especially Los Angeles, and that really does add a lot. Like, you can tell this is a real place, this is not a sound stage. And yeah, they get... There, there's some really, really effective stuff that... Yeah, is, is in part because of that. The music was handled by Graham Ravel, who has 112 total credits as composer. There's a short called Tiffany and Chucky. Oh, bef as a like a prequel. Huh, I'd watch that. Um, but yeah, and he has... Let's see... Yeah, yeah, he did Eon Flux, Harsh Time, Sin City, The Assault on Precinct 13 Remake, Freddy vs. Jason, Daredevil. He has genre experience, and that does really show here. Let's see. Yeah, he, he did The Siege, The Big Hit, Second Crow Movie, The Craft, From Dusk Till Dawn. Street Fighter, and the first Crow. So yeah, um, you know, genre experience, and yeah, like the the music here does feel like the sort of like this movie is set in the year 1999, but it's not our 1999. It's definitely this. The, I I really I. It's frustrating that there are people who wrote in the reviews. They think that. Oh, the, so the movie's saying that this would happen in four years? No, it absolutely is not. This movie is saying, like, basically, can you imagine if this was the year 1990? It, it's more like the kind of thing of, like, you know, we have to be careful we don't end up like this. Not in four years, because the technology leap is way too big for, for that kind of thing. But 
yeah, the music feels like this sort of, you know, dystopian, like, you know, yeah, we're in L.A., we're in, you know. Do not get James Cameron going in, like, destroying L.A. in his movies. Like, he is just... The, like, literally, the the first, you know, okay, so technically he directed Piranha 2, but his real first movie is The Terminator, and literally the first thing we see is this just complete, you know, wreckage of city, and then it says Los Angeles, uh, you know, 2024, I think, you know, so, dude just loves uh, destroying LA. I guess he has a love-hate relationship with the city, but... Yeah, the music really does capture the 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 tone very well. And right, there's some really great sound design. The 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 clips require very careful sound design and yeah, they do a really great job. It's this thing of like we're not like technically some of those things don't make as much noise as they seem to in the clips. But it's also getting across to the to us, the viewer, the viewers of the movie Strange Days, that the clip is not just, oh, it has a soundtrack. No, it's like making you feel things. And sound is one of the most effective. It's it's a shortcut directly into the, you know, the, the lizard brain. You know, certain things we hear really, really get our attention and, and have a strong reaction. But yeah, the pacing of this is definitely... <sighs> okay, so this movie is 2 hours and 19 minutes if you don't count end credits, and you don't really need to, to sit through them. Like, you know, they're, they're fine. And 2 hours and 25 minutes width, and it is at least half an hour too long. Like, not even... at, at the very, very least. Like, it is ridiculous that it's this long for the amount of big revelations about the mystery, for how little action there is in a movie that literally opens with one of the actions. Like, it's one of those movies that, like, right at the very start, you get, you know, a taste of what's to come, and then for a lot of the movie, you really don't get more like it's it's trying to keep the pot simmering and I mean I never I was never really bored but I do think that it pushes it too far you know and it just doesn't like James Cameron can do this kind of thing he he does you know like you know I mentioned that he likes to make long movies I do think that aliens is um, you know, I, I I forget who, but someone on Crack said the the um, the director's cut is not actually better, but there's more movies, so we like to pretend it's better. That's probably true, but if I'm gonna be honest, you know, I have a DVD that has both versions. I almost always watch, and I watch it very frequently. I almost always sit down and watch the the special edition, and and not just the. Hold on, center myself. There we go. I do think that he, under the right circumstances, he can do really well. And that's also a movie that very much, like, it builds and builds in a way where this movie, like, Aliens starts here and slowly works its way to the top. This movie kind of starts here and then doesn't have very far to go, and takes a lot of time to get there. And, yeah, this movie would definitely benefit greatly from being significantly shortened. And, like, yeah, you'd have to, like, change... It. You, you couldn't edit it down, which is probably why it ended up being really... Like, I'm sure studio heads were, like, pulling their hair out, looking at... Because, technically, you can't really re-edit it. If you take very much out in editing there's just like the movie no longer completely makes sense you know and they weren't trying to make Batman be Superman so they didn't want to do that 
yeah, it's just the the. I I wish that that Cameron had just written it in a way where you could remove because that was the thing with you know he didn't mean to do that with aliens maybe that's it actually maybe because because he actually regretted them rem y yes ultimately he regretted that they removed stuff from uh, he's he was very happy that he was eventually able to show the special edition of aliens but in that movie yeah you can just remove a chunk of it and that's exactly what they did they took out like a reel or or two and and yeah like it's world building but you ultimately don't need it to be able to follow the rest of the movie and for this movie I don't know what you would remove like on honestly if you have an idea for how to edit this down like what stuff to trim out where the movie would still make sense please put it in the comments I'd be very fascinated to, to I will be going over some ideas I have for rewrites when I get into spoilers. But there's no way for me to do that without spoiling. So, yeah, the best elements, uh, you know, I, I do think that the... I, I will talk more about the squid clip thing in the, the spoiler section. You know, that is legitimately a, a cool concept and very, very cyberpunk especially the fact that it's basically being peddled like a drug like you know there's there's some technologies in the real world where it's like oh you know this this rich you know th this is this is very expensive but you know you could travel to this place you could engage in this really costly thing and you'd have you know the clips are absolutely not that you know and and I really appreciate that element of it and Honestly, like I, I wish he had made more. You know, I know his career is over, but I, I, I think. To be fair, I love cyberpunk, and the fact that he's really good at it, you know, is part of it. Evidently, James Cameron, you know, he had the choice. Evidently, it was he didn't want to do more of it than than he ended up doing, really. But, you know. Some of the writing for this and the the two Terminator movies, you know, just okay. If I'm being brutally honest, the first Terminator movie, you know, I I really really love and and he shows a real aptitude for like taking these things and because because that's the thing, you know, like you know, if we think back, like before the Terminator, and I, it wasn't like the only the thing, might have been the first. Before that, if you look at how, like, robots, you know, true, sometimes they were intimidating. Like, certainly, I cannot believe I'm blanking on the name, but I'll have it momentarily. Um, um, the day the Earth stood still. Gort. Certainly Gort can be intimidating, but he is a very effective tool. You know, as long as you have control of him, he is a very effective tool. And then the Terminator comes around and says, no, robots are not a tool for humans at all. They are going to destroy us all, you know. And that's the kind of thing, this this kind of very pessimistic, dystopian idea of future technology. You know, robots being the thing that ends the world, not improves it. That was very, very different and... There's a lot of stories since the Terminator that have taken that and really run with it. And, you know, I, th I think a lot of them are very compelling, maybe not as compelling to me at least as the original Terminator, but, you know, I, I, I do have a bit of a pessimistic side. And the idea that things, like new technology being developed, it might make things better for people at the very top, but it's not going to be the great equalizer. And this is, you know, that was something that was thought. You know, if you look at like 60 sci-fi, not all of it, but some of it is very much like, I mean, everything's going to be great. You know, you have your Star Trek, for example, you know, very utopian. And I'm not saying that that's like bad. I do think we need that as well. We need 
to be able to hope for the future. But a lot of the stories, you know, that, that's, yeah, that's the thing. We need both. We need stuff like Cyberpunk to help remind us things might be getting better for some people, not for everyone. You know, and that is the thing. Like, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, yeah, it certainly made some people very rich. And for some people, it made things a lot better. But a lot of the people working in those industrial plants, like, their lives were not better. A number of them died because the the machines would keep going. Like, you know, it before the Industrial Revolution, there was some sense that, well, you need the person to, to do the work, you know. But then some of these machines is like, well, I mean, let's just get someone else and they'll do the rest of the work, you know the the so so yeah um but but yeah it's a tie between that and a harsh but honest exploration of the tensions of big city life in the 90s and yeah so the the right i i wanted to briefly say so i talked about the movie being too long it is definitely the kind of thing where if you watch if you watch the first 40 minutes and you just feel like it's not moving quite fast enough the the plot itself you know the movie usually has something going on but the plot itself you know no the the movie probably isn't going to you know and and the it's the kind of thing where if you you know not everybody will feel like it was worth sitting through the entire movie now, the, the worst aspect, um, and before I get into the following, I should probably say I've never done drugs. I almost definitely never will. I don't have a problem with those that do. It's just not for me. I've, I've been very privileged to never end up in a situation where it was extremely likely to happen. So the following is not coming from the point of view of someone who's ever done drugs. This movie is definitely too narrow-minded when it comes to the problem of drug use. It's very war on drugs, just say no, dare. I do really appreciate that this has a black person yelling at a white person to get off drugs rather than the opposite, since evidently those were the two options. But, yeah. Um, there's that, and then there's how it views women and race relations. And, let's see. So, so yeah, um, something other, I, I saw a number of reviewers say was the worst thing about it, that it's way too obvious, and it's an assault on the senses, and yeah, I don't really disagree with those. I just don't think they're big problems. The thing I was most worried about was James Cameron's writing weaknesses, and it definitely has some issues with that. And the thing I was most looking forward to was the cast, and they are enjoyable, in it for sure. The trailer does give too much away and there's some chance that you know if if you like the movie you're more like if you like the trailer you're more likely to like the movie. Um the trailer is probably worth watching at least once though, you know, maybe make it after you've watched the the entire movie. Uh, the cover and poster don't give too much away. They don't give you that strong a sense of what the movie is like. It's, you know, just... It's it's the faces of the... You know... of I, I was going to say the three leads, but I, I don't know that I would say Juliet Lewis is quite a lead. Uh, the two leads and a major character. You know, Mace, Nero, and Faith. Now, that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes, where it has a 68 on the tomato meter, based on 56 reviews, 38 of them fresh, 6.50 out of 10. Uh, the and, and the user rating is 20, uh, 73% based on over 25,000 ratings. The average rating is 3.7 out of 5. And let's see. Yeah. Uh, the consensus 
Strange Days struggles to make most of its futuristic premise, but what's left remains a well-directed, reasonably enjoyable sci-fi fantasy. On Metacritic, it has a 66 out of 100 from critics, you know, generally favor favorable reviews uh, based on 30 critic reviews, 20 positive, 8 mixed, 2 negative, and let's see, yeah, uh, the 2 negative ones do a very, yeah, I, I can't really disagree with what they put in the in the quote and yeah um, the user score is 8.3 out of 10 universal acclaim but based on 102 ratings 86 positive 7 mixed and 9 negative uh, there's one mixed review um, And, okay, he's basically saying he doesn't think that Nero is alpha enough. All the other reviews are positive. And on IMDB, it has... Uh, the, the overall score is 7.2 out of 10, based on 76,000... Ratings, 27.9% gave it 7, 22 gave it 8, 14% gave it 6, 11.9 gave it 9, 8.9 gave it 10, 6.0 gave it 5, 2.6 gave it 4, 1.3 gave it 3, another 1.3 gave it 1, 0 0.8 gave it 2. This is one of the rare cases where I would definitely say I can understand giving it like a, a one or a three um you know so, some people feel that it's like an assault on the senses and yeah ultimately i can't really disagree and it's it's too long for that kind of thing i earlier i said you know it's someone like neville dean taylor you know say what you will about them they tend to be like their their movies don't tend to overstay their welcome. You know, the Crank movies are both around 90 minutes. Gamer, I believe, is also like 90 minutes. Um, I honestly don't remember... What, what is their Ghost Rider? That's also around 90 minutes. So, you know, 2 hours, 25 minutes, that's way too much for something this, like, sensory overload inducing and... Yeah, I can understand giving it a very, very low rating, even a 1 or a 3, simply based on that. Uh, I am sure this movie caused headaches in the 90s. You know, I'm used to, to watching stuff that, you know, I've, I've seen worse. You know, uh, so I'm, I'm fine. It didn't worsen my headache, but it it's, you know, I'm also watching it 28 years later, and that's not... It's not necessarily a great compliment to, to give a movie to say, oh, it's, you know, just wait like 30 years and it'll be fine. You know, but, but me, someone who's watched YouTube since 2000-something, uh, you know, for, for maybe 20 years, you know, oh, hold on, not quite 20, but yeah. I've probably been watching YouTube as long as it's existed. You know, I, I watch stuff, some stuff that's that's frenetically edited and, and such. You know, some of my favorite movies are very, you know, yeah. You know, I, I love the way that Crank 1 and 2 are shot and edited. You know, this, this very music video kind of, you know. But, yeah, 2 hours, 25 minutes, too long. On IMDb, there are 277 user reviews, or 241, if you hide spoilers. And 11 of the top 100, which were the ones I read, 11 of them gave it a 1 out of 10. 2 gave it 2, another 2 gave it 3, 9 gave it 4, 9 gave it 5, 13 gave it 6, 
12 gave it 7, 21 gave it 8, 10 gave it 9, and 17 gave it 10. So overall, more people, you know, liked or even loved it, but that's still, like, that's more than 10% that, that really, really hated it. And let's see, the... The special effects are good. It's not a very like special effect heavy movie, especially for a science fiction movie, you know, or, or part science fiction. You know, not not all cyberpunk has a lot of special effects, but the the effects are good. Uh, tend to be practical. You know, there are a few like visual effects that are basically. Or I guess video effects, really, you know, like filters put over footage that's been recorded, and yeah. Uh, other than that, it's it's fairly basic, like squibs and and you know, yeah. And that's all, perhaps also, you know, when people saw James Cameron's name, they may have expected. You know, he is known for pushing visual effects, and here, you know, yeah, there's, like, technology is pushed, but it's the POV, you know, it's not, you know, yeah, the, the kinds of things that we've seen him, you know, yeah, the, the put on screen in, in other movies. Now in the in the description box I I put in Renegade's Renegade Cuts excellent video it's it's as its own uh, you know the the like I mentioned earlier the first chunk of links are all about SAG AFTRA um I think that might be about yeah um, I rate this seven explorations of inner city conflict out of ten, and you know this is definitely like if we're talking like politics and such, it doesn't really hold up. It needed to be much more like critical of certain aspect, certain aspects, and push certain things much further. Um, but, you know, as far as it being watchable, you know, there's there's some movies from the 80s and 90s. If I sit down and try to watch today, I'm going to struggle to get through the entire thing, you know. And it's not, it's just, you know, movies today, for the Hollywood movies today, tend to be bigger, move faster, and, and such, you know. Um, yeah. I, like, if I had, yeah, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I don't think that it's one of those movies that are necessarily going to get, like, a big re-evaluation. Um, and I don't know that I think that it deserved better. Like, I'd like to think that the failure of it was not, the, the financial failure was not due to its empathy for, you know, women and, and black people, but I... Certainly there are other reasons why it would have failed. Like, if, you, if you've got a movie in theaters that's supposed to make a lot of money, like, two things you're going to want is for people who watch it to go and tell all their friends, you got to watch this. And for everyone to, yeah, as, as many people as possible, to watch it more than once. And that's not super likely with this. Like, I can understand, you know, it's, it is it is the kind of thing, like, if it had come out, you know, if you, if, if you showed this to someone who didn't know the actors well enough to be able to clock it as, ah, it's got to be, like, mid-90s, if you show it to someone today and not necessarily lie, but just allow them to think that it's recent, they might be more inclined to to like it compared to, you know, I, I don't know anyone who watched it in 95, but I can imagine a lot of people, you know, the, the 
sensory overload, the 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 length of it, and just yeah, and and some elements that I'll talk about in the spoilers. Yeah. Um. Overall, I I. Hmm. So yes, this is when this is where I update the ranking, and yeah, yeah. Overall, this is my favorite of the movies that he that that James Cameron wrote that he didn't direct. It is, in my opinion, better than Dark Fate, Rambo Two, Alita. I will say it's close when it comes to Alita, um, but ultimately that movie just does not completely. Yeah, I, I did an entire video specifically about that movie. Um, yeah. That is it for the review itself. So from here on out, there will be spoilers. And yeah, let's get right into it with notes taken while watching. So we open on the POV drugstore robbery. The cops show up. Wait, what did the the rob? Crap! What what are those called? It's not a drugstore. Um, liquor store, I guess. Anyway, you know, cops show up. You know, they try to survive. One guy tries to shoot at with them, and it ends with the guy falling to his death. And like, I mean. Considering that Kane and Lynch is a love letter to a lot of, like, 90s genre movies, I guess it was, it was bound for one of them to be a James Cameron joint, you know, like, a lot of what they, they take from is definitely Tarantino. Uh, there's a lot of heat um, by Michael Mann. Yeah, I would definitely say that the... The second Kane and Lynch, I, I always mix up the names, but I believe the second one is Dog Days. First one is Dead Men. In the second one, there's this multiplayer thing where, like, you you go on a, a heist, and you know the the cops show up, and, and there's all, you know. So yeah, you see how there's some inspiration from Heat there, but the the constant like the the yeah, the way that they're yelling at each other, and just the 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 sort the the fact that it's like one continuous take, which you know, of course, for multiplayer, there's not going to be a bunch of cuts. Yeah, I would definitely say it took some. They took some inspiration from from this scene, and let's see. Yeah, so we have the. Yeah, yeah. Um, some radio call-ins, and they talk about gas being too expensive, and school shootings, and oh wow, that is a depressing reminder of how little has changed in 28 years. Like, school shootings are so much worse now than they were in 95, so that's, that's, uh, yeah... I, I if if I edited my videos now, I guess this is where I would edit in a clip of Heel vs. Babyface shouting about how dare you fucking current day us. That is legitimately like if you want some some free entertainment, watching him completely lose it over pronouns, that's that is that is very, very funny. And I I agree with DJ Eric, we should all point and laugh at him. Hey, that is that is truly pathetic. Uh, chaos, organized chaos, also did a really great video. It's, it's basically a compilation of leftists, you know, yeah, criticizing the yeah, um, right. And and one of the riot like part of part of the the riot uh, the rioting is that santa is being beaten on the street which i think james cameron was hoping would have us like 
No, you can't do that. Monocle's popping out. I just feel like, I mean, Popeye says a lot of shit, you know? Bound to happen. And, yeah, so everyone who calls in to the radio is expressing some sort of anxiety. You know, uh, the yeah, so I already mentioned the, the gas prices and school shootings. There's another guy expressing racial tension. And then you have this woman talking about, oh, it's the end of days. And I quite appreciate, and that's, I, I think James Cameron may have enjoyed writing, because he's not. He is not the biggest fan of people who, like, talk about, oh, we have huge problems, and then, like, point to the completely wrong thing. So, yeah. Um, I, I think he had some fun writing the, the radio d DJ. And, and it's like, I mean, it's not a terrible point. Whose time, that, what was it? Uh, whose time? Whose time zone? is God in? Because, like, you know, the world's too big to just say, oh, that, ex you know, yeah. Um, I enjoyed that very much. Thank you, James. I would like another. And we see the, the, the porno clip, which is, like, I, I think it's supposed to be, like, a twist that it's, you know, sapphic. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that was the, the, yeah. Um, and, and he's like going in and, and telling them, you know, it's, it's good, but here's some, here's some constructive criticism, which that, yeah. I, again, I I feel like that's you know that's supposed to be like oh you know he's so, he's completely desensitized to it, and it's like I that's internet porn had not taken off at the time the, to the extent that it has today, but I feel like that's probably there's probably straight white cis men who write shit like that in comments sections for the anyway and the yeah I do, I do think that it is legitimately you know the the two cops I gotta say the fact you know I didn't want to bring it up in the in the video itself but Vincent D'Onofrio you know really Letting himself be as as I, I you know be as be as repulsive as possible. I quite appreciate when you have white male actors who acknowledge, you know what, white men do a lot of fucked up shit. I'm going to go ahead and play characters like that so that we can acknowledge and try to solve this. You know, he's there's there's very there's some there's some. Ah, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Private Pile energy, especially near the end with, with the eyes, like, you know, this is my rifle, this is my gun. Very, you know, and, and some some pre-Kingpin Kingpin going on as, as well. And William Fickner, I think this might be the, the oldest thing that Fickner's in that I've seen. Baby-faced little Fickner. That was, yeah. Big, big fan of him. You know, he's always intense. It's always fun to watch, you know. And and he's also one of the ones who's, like, willing to to play characters that are really, really awful. And, like, is it just me or does he kind of like roles that are... It's not all... He's not always playing a cop, but, like, if not a cop... It's probably a crook or possibly a freedom fighter, but he certainly takes a lot of roles where, in in one way or another, he is involved in violence that you know maybe hits or may, maybe interacts with with law enforcement in in some way. And yeah, he's always really really entertaining to watch. You know, he's he's a 
he can he can really steal a scene. Like he's he's deeply compelling in The Dark Knight, and he's not in very much of that movie. But but yeah, when when the you know they're they're running, they're chasing down Iris, you know, firing uh, you know guns, and it is legitimately quite tense and suspenseful. You know, the 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 movie is more tense and suspenseful than it had than than action heavy. But when, like, the train pulls in and the doors to open, everyone steps off, and the cops are just standing there, you know, where is she, where is she, you know, and the doors start to close, and then she bolts out, you know, in, you know, doors close, they shoot, it's, it's yeah, that was, that was quite cool, and the wig comes off, and there was a squid, and they're like, fuck, you know, that was legitimately, yeah, you know, Fair enough, movie, you have my attention. You know, the squid has just been explained to us by Lenny, you know, just like two minutes prior in the movie. So, let's see. And, yeah, we see that, you know, when Lenny is alone, he watches clips of Faith. And, like, the fact that he still has these, like, it, it is kind of gross that we're supposed to empathize with him even after we see this thing of, like, you know, he's still keeping around. Like, I guess it's not quite revenge porn because he's not showing it to every anyone as far as we can tell. He, he keeps them to himself. But, like... You know, if you have stuff like that of your ex, maybe destroy it. Like, it's it's gross to keep stuff like that around, but there's sadly a lot of straight, wa straight white men who don't get that that's actually, you know, I, I get it. Like, it's, you know, oh, he's remembering better times, you know, and, and like, certainly it does really help underline that he's, you know, he... There's room for redemption here because he's in a bad place. You know, he doesn't go home and live a lot. You know, some someone says later, you know, you don't live, you don't live your own life. You just peddle pieces of other people's lives. You know, and 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 it's also just like the 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 clip of faith. Like it just goes on for so much longer than it needed to. It, it's really really unnecessary um yeah let's see and right and and in the clip faith says i love the way your eyes see which i feel like that's supposed to be significant i'm not sure i 100% I mean, I guess, is it just the fact that he used to be passive and, like, by the end of the movie, he's more active? I, I suppose that's what it's supposed to be, that even in his prime, he was more passive. You know, and she also says, are you gonna, are you gonna watch or are you gonna do? And I, I do, that is something I do appreciate. I, I just, I don't think it needed to go on for as long as it does. And it, it didn't need to, like, show the nudity. You could have just implied it. But the fact that he does stare at her without doing anything, you know, yeah. That is, like, evidently that is part of his, his character. Let's see. And... On the... the I, I, is it on the radio or TV? Uh, TV, I think. The movie says that, you know, by a prediction, by 2025, we'll have our second American president. Oh, that's painful. That's so... God, they really did think that back then, didn't they? That that it was just, you know, sometime within the next 30 years, we're going to have, you know... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here and say I would be extremely surprised if... Yeah, what is it like? Late? I guess it's like 
next year sometime. There's uh, fuck. I would love it. There's some extremely talented women in politics, but I I think there's too much misogyny in America to for it to happen soon, and that really really sucks. Now, um, then Nero talks to this this young guy. I do not remember his character name, but like he's he's um. Ah, what's the word? He is, you know, it, Max refers to him as like preppy, so that's what we'll go with. The the preppy kid, you know, is is like we see, and that's something I want to say. I I appreciate that they didn't show that because it's, there's no need for us to see what he sees when you know we get a couple of words explaining it and that's it, you know, but. Yeah, we, we see his reaction to it, and then Nero explains, you know, that was the, the ah, let's see, you were an 18-year-old girl in the shower or something like that, you know. And I, I don't know if it's supposed to be gender euphoria, and it just accidentally, because I just, I feel, you know, Maybe maybe I'm wrong. If if I I don't know if I have any any trans people in my subscriber base. Um, you're certainly any you know you're extremely welcome here. But you know maybe I'm wrong about the falling. But it feels like it kind of slips into autogynophilia, and I I don't know. I mean I. That might have been the best that you could hope for at the time, and that's very sad. Um, I don't, I don't get the sense that it's supposed to that it's intentionally autogynophilia, but yeah. Let's see, and yeah, um, Nero's car is is towed, which of course delays the discovery of that clip. Which is, of course, one way you could rewrite this to be significantly shorter if so much time didn't pass between Iris dumping the clip in his car and him actually, you know, for, for a very long time, he, for maybe 30 minutes, he doesn't even know that it's there. But, but yeah, you know, the, the truck's being towed and he's like, can you just wait two minutes, okay, two minutes. And, you know, he turns back, and the car drives after two seconds. So, I don't know, maybe your eternal clocks are, you know, not set to the same. Anyway, and the... Yeah, uh, Lenny explains some things to Mr. Famitsu about Mace that maybe the viewer should also know. And... So they, they drive to the club because Nero talks Fumitsu into wanting that. Is the bouncer Hurley from Lost? I'm I'm No, he's he's not, but I just feel like there's a resemblance there. And though we don't see each of them, I get the sense that retinal fetish the club does indeed serve every fetish. You know, there's, there's like a guy willingly being shot at with uh, paintball guns and... Uh, was there... I feel like there was like piercing stuff going on. It went by kind of fast, but yeah. And yeah, Lenny says that Pi, uh, Philo treats Faith as an object. And this is, of course, true, but so does Lenny and the film. Like, it's it's supposed to, we're supposed to think, but that's okay, because, you know, of course the movie's going to sexualize her, because she used to sexualize herself. What do you want? You know, once a woman has ever sexualized herself, she's sexual all the time. There's no, you know, in between. And, I mean, Lenny he just wants to protect her, as if that isn't extremely patronizing. 
You know, I, I mean, basically, like, the movie, it's, it's one of those movies that kind of acts like women need men to make the decisions because if, if left to their own devices, they'll make the wrong choice. And that's just such a toxic patriarchal notion. Just, I'm, I'm really glad we're finally having media that challenges that. And she says, the way that films are still better than clips is that the music and the credits lets you know it's over. I mean, I, I get what they're going at. It's, it's so that she can shout, it's over, at him. But the the clips do clearly have an ending. Like, is does she mean that you don't know what happens after the end of a clip? Is that it? Because, like, a, the credits coming up on a, on a film, unless there's, like, a sequel, that is the end of that story. I, th I think it was very badly worded. And it feels like it might have been left over from an earlier draft where the clips were different. James Cameron's dialogue, it's not always amazing. And Lenny uses the information that Max gave him about Wade Beamer to try to talk him down, but does fail. I, I do appreciate the, the failing that's slightly funny. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate that the, the white man gets bailed out by a black woman. You know, there's so many movies where they act like we white people have to... You know, I, I will admit, I, I think I do possibly have a white savior complex. That is something I'm, I'm working on dealing with. But yeah, um, there's a lot of movies where, you know, oh, if, if a white person doesn't save a black person, what can the black person do when really, like, there's a lot of black people, you know, for example, here on YouTube, who'll, who'll tell you, who'll tell me, us, just get out of our way. Like, just stop holding down black people. That's really, you know, they, they don't need saving. They, they, you know, they're just as capable as white people are, you know. And again, I, I, it feels ridiculous to even say those words because of course they are. Of course they are. But there's so much media that refuses to believe that but but yeah you know in this movie basically women are either pure or sexual there's no in between you know like mace evidently she had sex at least once because she has a son but that's it you know she wasn't sexual in front of ever, anyone other than her husband so you know that's okay there's no you know she she's pure for the entire film she's actually she's downright asexual, which I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but it just feels like that's, they're, they're worried that, like, it, yeah, only at the very end is there any expression of, of sexuality or sensuality involving her. Like, nobody even says, you know, talks about, oh, I'd love to have sex with Mace, you know, but at the very, very end, you have the, the kiss. But other than that, there's, there's not actually, yeah, so, you know, and it's just like, like, like I mentioned earlier in, in this video, sex and nudity are just parts of life, you know, and I really, you know, that's just like, I'm, I'm Danish. I was told this, you know, many, many years ago, you know, in, in Denmark, like I suppose some people do, but a lot for a lot of us we're taught that that's it's just a natural part of life you know we're much less prudish and yeah i i i'm glad that at least some movies are showing a tendency towards being less obsessed with because the thing is if you if you make it this illicit thing then of course you know you know, anyone who, who feel, you know, any, any young adult is going to feel, is, is going to obsess about it. And then either feel really bad if they're taught to, to feel bad about it, or just think that it's bigger than it is. That is not, I did not mean for that pun, and that's unfortunate. But just, you know, it's, 
it's a natural part of adult life. It's not, you know, it's not going to, like, change your life, you know. And, it, yeah, moving on. And, right, uh, I do appreciate that, you know, in this movie, like, clips let you do or be anything you want, which, you know, wasn't the case at the time, but today, yeah, with the internet, you know, some, for some things you'll need, like, games, it won't necessarily be free of charge, but yeah, today you basically can, and there are some people who, you know, some people, when when there's pronouns in an RPG, they lose their shit on the internet. You know, it's... Uh, yeah. And, and the... the um, yeah, you know, I, I really respect that the movie did foresee that that something you know it's not like you know James Cameron is not always right in in his predictions but here you know it's it's different although you know I actually I suppose you know it was basically like the the VR VR headsets he predicted here you know and that is you know and and I think I have to say this is not the only a movie that has something like that in the 90s. I am very, very glad that they went for... that they didn't try to do it with CG the way that Lawnmower Man did, you know. And this movie is also significantly less goofy than Virtuosity, you know. So, yeah, that element actually aged significantly better than a lot of its brethren. You know, but but yeah, um, the you know he wasn't the first to predict this sort of thing. Like uh, Videodrome also predicted a lot of the internet, and that's from '83, 12 years prior. I don't like when people say you know oh you know if, if this was made today the movie would be completely broken because of cell phones, but I do gotta just bring up the fact that you'd have to completely rewrite this. The fact that, like, Iris, you know, she has to use a payphone rather than a cell phone, and she has to call Lenny's home phone instead of a cell phone. Like, you'd just have to write both of their cell phones out of the... Because the... If, if one of them, you know... Yeah... If, if she has her cell phone, but he doesn't, you know, she could, she, ah, let's see, yeah, she could call again, she wouldn't have to stay at a phone booth. If his cell phone works, but hers doesn't, she's going to call his cell phone from the phone booth. Let's see, I, I, I guess what I'm, it's, what I'm trying to say is, it's, it's, fascinating that the the when writing this James Cameron thought that we would have sensory you know recordings before we had cell phones you know it's just it's interesting the way that because like we have you know like I I don't know I, I don't know a single person who doesn't have a cell phone today, you know, like, the, the, um, just, yeah, um, you know, and, and it actually, and, and that's the thing, like, the movie, today, we do have a lot of recordings of real life events, they're usually taken on cell phones, you know, unless it's like a documentary or something. If you see a video online that's of like just a real event, it was probably because someone whipped out their cell phone to, to so yeah. And yeah, so the the we see the the clip of the the rape. And, you know, it doesn't actually explore the pain that the woman feels. It just exploits it, unlike the 2003 movie 
monster or the I, I remember that it's called Nightingale when is it from again it is from 2018 you know and like the thing is you could easily rewrite it like hypothetically if you rewrote it to combine Iris and Faith so that Faith is the one who is raped and that's supposed to be like a threat that's supposed to keep her quiet and you know it would add a layer to the character of faith which is sorely lacking as it is you know and and yeah just like the fact that such an important event in this movie is the the rape of a woman and we know almost nothing about Iris, and every single time we see her, she's either being threatened, sexualized, or both. You know, there's no... We never see her just have a normal day at home, for example. You know, she's always just... Yeah, and, and I really... And think about, like, you could, you could actually rewrite it to where, like, Mace had some sexuality to her, maybe even was a sex worker, and you see, you know, at the end of that, she goes home, she takes care of her kid. You know, that's something that, extra like, there's so many people who can't fathom the idea that it is possible to be a sex worker and a good parent. You know, so... And this was actually, yeah, I, I think this came out like the year before Striptease, the, the um, Demi Moore movie. Yeah, one year prior to that. You know, that one definitely has its flaws, but it's at least trying to humanize sex workers. Um, yeah, honestly, I, th I think it would be, yeah, I've made my about that. Let's see. Right, and yeah, Mace says, you know, I don't use that shit about the drug coded clips as if drugs are an individual problem, which is not even remotely the the case in in real life it's not about oh you just got to be strong enough and say no like obviously it's important to do that but that's not the whole solution the movie never brings up well how do you actually solve drugs other than saying it's just you know Nero just has to stop watching clips of his girlfriend yeah he definitely does at least the ones where she's naked but that's not the whole thing like there's a there's a profit motive to the war on drugs that the movie I don't I I suppose I I don't know if it was something that was I mean I guess it's not even I don't know if it's considered common knowledge today but certainly bad you know at the time it wasn't and that's the thing you know like I mentioned in the review you know conservatives controlling the conversation like I don't I'm not the right person to explain it well but there is there is a drug there's a, a profit motive to the the war on drugs it's not about preventing people from being on drugs there's a there's a profit motive and it's also a way to control certain parts of the population uh, the war on drugs was in part started to attack black people who were not voting for Nixon and hippies who were like protesting, uh, let's see, was it Vietnam or was it just, I, I forget, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was Vietnam, yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's a there's a direct quote, we couldn't make it illegal, let's see if I can, um, let's see, yeah, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be 
either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana, the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And this, that's a, an admission from John Ehrlichman. He was assistant to the president for domestic affairs under Richard Nixon. And... Yeah, yeah. Um, the Nixon campaign in 68 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. And yeah, that's that's part of it. And then there's also all these money being made by, you know, white people in American government by controlling the, the flow of drugs. Now... Let's see. I, I will say I appreciate, you know, Philo Gant is this, like, record producer, mu yeah, music producer slash club owner kind of thing, you know. Yeah, he seems to be like both. Anyway, um, and he's very scummy, and that is sadly something that, that was true at the time, that's true today, you know. So, you know, if you look at, uh, uh, what was her name again? Um, the, um, let's see, Kesha was, yeah, yeah, the, the music producer, Dr. Luke, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna get into it here, but that's, you know, Philo Gant reminds me of Dr. Luke, is what I'm saying. You know, if, if you want to know more, there's a lot of information out there. Um, I, the, the woman that beats Lenny, I'm not entirely sure if she's supposed to be trans or, like, cer certainly she's not the most traditionally feminine woman, and it's this thing of, like, I'm, I'm not 100% certain who the actor is. So, to, to oh, uh, huh, Lou, Louise Le, Le Cavalier, and the character is Cindy Vita Min. Um, I'm not seeing, let's see. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not seeing if, uh, Louise is trans or not, but, you know, uh, they're, they're certainly drawing this distinction that, you know, if, if you are feminine, you cannot also have, have violence in you, and, you know, I, I, I think that might have started out, I, th I think, well, not started out, I think some people consider that, like, a positive uh, cliche, but the problem is it leads a lot of men to not take women's pain seriously, uh, women's anger seriously, so, yeah, um, not really a fan of the, you know, them making that choice in casting and right uh, I saw some people in the, some, some review some user reviews were saying they they didn't believe that Mace would win I mean she was fighting to win she wasn't fighting to to hurt the other person which is what everyone she fights was doing you know I, I appreciate that you know I, I know some I'm, I'm not, obviously there is some, like, upper body strength, you know, some, uh, some, some men, at least, are capable of, of, of higher upper body strength than a, a lot of, of women. But, like, if you look at the way, you know, she, she, like, hits some, you know, she hits one guy in the crotch, I think she hits one in like the the solar plexus, like you know they're they're hitting Lenny over and over just to cause a lot of pain, 
and perhaps also injury, but they're not like and and when they fight Mace, they're still moving like that. They're I I think the idea is supposed to be that they're used to roughing people up, but they're not good in a fight. Whereas Mace has to be good in a fight. And you know, I you know, some some people don't like when women win fights in movies. I just think it's worth appreciating that they clearly put thought into it when making the movie. And yeah, you know, according to this film, black men are angry and possibly dangerous and violent. The, the only black little boys are capable of, of innocence. You know, the uh, uh, Xander is innocent each time we see him, but he's the only one. And, you know, it, it's said, like, we only very briefly see his father, but I, it was completely unnecessary for them to say, oh, you know, the, the, you know, he was violent in front of his own son. You know, like, the, the, that doesn't inspire empathy when, like, clearly the movie wants us to have at least some empathy for for black people you know you you could have made that be an unfair thing by the police the way that the death of jericho one is it, i i do find it interesting that james cameron has not written more murder mysteries because like some of the writing for the murder mystery is good even great, like I, I do think you know. I, I, I'm aware that some people really did not like the reveal that it was Max who did it. I thought it worked. You know, he says early on he's toying with you, and he's, you know, this is obviously in part because he knows because it's him, but that also explains why he keeps being so close to him. And I felt like he explained it very well near the, the very end. You know, he says, I had to frame you for the murder of Philo so I could leave with Faith. You know, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's logic to what he says. And, you know, if you're twisted enough, you're willing to kill your, your friend. And... Let's see. Yeah, and, and we have a clip of Lenny being threatened, uh, you know, and, and he sees, yeah, the guy did actually take that, uh, you know, the, uh, what are they called again? Exacto knives? I, f I forget. Um, don't use one much myself, so, and certainly not in, you know, day to day I speak Danish. I've never had to ask someone where, you know, what aisle would I find an exacto knife in English? So, anyway, um, but, but yeah, you know, Nero checks, and yeah, he does indeed have the, the mark. Let's see, and yeah, they talk about, you know, oh, this guy's really fucked up. He must have brain trauma, like you might get from a twenty-two bullet in your skull, like we you know Max had... So, you know, we have a little bit of, of information. I gotta say, I did not guess, you know, I mean, this time I remembered, but the first, my first viewing, I didn't guess that it was Max. And, yeah, and finally they get the clip that the viewer already knows is in the car, and the cop duo show up, and... Yeah, like, there's a very little action in this movie in the way that James Cameron usually delivers, like, shoot shootouts, chases on foot or in vehicles. What there is is quite good. Catherine Bigelow clearly handles that very well. And the, the two cops don't have a lot of screen time, even though they are quite compelling. And I don't know if, like, obviously, I'm not saying that a movie about black pain should center on two white guys, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm just noting that they don't have a lot of screen time. Now we see that Mace, when, when she's not in the house, her sister babysits, 
And this is something that uh, there's a lot of black communities where it really is a community. You know, the, the family will help each other out in a way that is less prevalent, I, I believe, in, in American white society where there's more of a sense of no every every you know everyone every man for himself basically and yeah uh, you know I, I appreciate that that's there like before they say a word you know it's like oh okay there's a babysitter you know it would be ridiculous based on what we know about mace there's no way she leaves her son alone you know but then they start you know the, the yeah Evidently, they are, you know, the, she, she calls her aunt, says, you know, she ref, Mace refers to, to uh, wait, was it Cecily? Hold on, I'll have it momentarily. She refers to her as aunt. Uh, maybe I won't, yeah, C C Cecily. Cecile? I feel like she pronounces Cecily. Um, but, but yeah, you know, she calls her aunt, which I suppose it's possible that it's, that, that they're not actually like, but, but, you know, it is, it is something that I have heard black people talk about here on YouTube. So, so yeah, you know, that's at least a positive aspect then. Right. And the, yeah, the film also seems to think that, you know, pretty much every black person is poor and you know if you don't have a job that's and that's a you problem that's individual not systemic you know only those of strong character can have a, a job and that's again just that's I, I I realized at the time and still some today that's what conservatives say about black people most of them are just not you know they're not they 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 can't get a job or they can't hold a job and it's them it's the problem is them when in reality it's racism and i i, just, I wish because it would be so easy like just have mace do a flawless job talk to her boss and her boss says i can't believe you did this so that we the viewer would see no but she did everything right we'd be able to to grok it's the boss who's, it's the, you know, make him this really stereotypical white guy, rich white guy, you know, it's, yeah. I'm not saying that only rich white guys are racist. And, yeah, and we see the, the recording, and I have some words about the Jericho One part, which I'll go into in the next section of this video, but Iris's escape is just ridiculously contrived. I will say I did think it was very, very cool that she apparently, like, she runs past a train and that gives her some, some time to, to further escape. And I have to assume that it's an intentional... Apparently, it is a an urban legend. It was something used to sell newspapers. But there is the, the notion that when movies were first, you know, when, when the medium of film, of, of moving pictures was being, you know, or in the early days, there was this, you know, some, someone had set up a camera close to a train, like the train passed by the camera, it didn't hit the camera, and supposedly some people ran scared from the movie theater, apparently that was just a hoax, but... You know, when you're sitting, because because this movie did originally hit theaters. You know, if you're sitting there in '95, and the train is approaching the POV shot camera, you're probably like, you're not necessarily gonna run from the theater. But like, I'm, I'll fully admit, you know, I knew it. I know it's a movie, and I'm still like, oh, don't, you know, I don't want to get hit by a train. And. And I do appreciate that, you know, early in the movie, you know, someone says it's a police state. And then, you know, in this, you know, once we've seen these two cops execute, you know, yeah, one cop execute Jericho, one, the other one have no problem with it. And then they chase Iris, you know, then we see 
it demonstrated the idea that it's a police state. You know, there's there's tanks in the streets, and they're being you know their ID is checked in order to to pass. And yeah, so Tick basically OD'd. This is your brain on drugs. Like he literally says, it's like his brain is like two runny eggs or so something along those lines. And yeah, and and Faith, uh, you know, helps explain fill, fill in some of the the blanks. And yeah, we're told room twenty two oh three. And yeah, Angela Bassett says right here, right now, which is indeed where the you know for the what's it called. That's that's where it's from for that um, song. I will have it momentarily. Uh, oh, right, right. That should do it. So right here, right now. Yeah. Um, Fat Boy Slim, you know, made the the. Yeah. The song right here, right now, using the the sample from the scene. I had forgotten. Like, there's a bunch of other, you know. Like, I think it's at least the third time that someone says "right here, right now" in the movie. But it is the the one. I I get why that one is the one that was sampled. It does sound really great. And she does the equivalent of flushing his stash down the, the toilet, you know. To, you know, she she throws the, the clips on the ground, stomps on them. You know, so the way that the black woman helps the white man is by destroying things and beating people up. That's not the wonderful representation that they I'd like to think thought that it was. I think too much of the film is dedicated to the this thing about you know Lenny wanting to protect Faith. It's just like I mentioned, it's it's a misogynist trope that women need men to to protect them, and you could easily see how this could be rewritten to where she could you know take care of herself. You know, and I, that that's the, like. Watching Natural Born Killers, I didn't get the sense that the Juliette Lewis character needed anyone. Um, M M Mallory, her name was Mallory in that movie, you know. Like, she's she's with Mickey, sure, but that's because they love each other, that they're in love. Not because she needs some other person. Like, in a, in a, as a protect, so, source of protection. And, yeah, so 106 minutes into the film, we're told that there's 50 minutes left before Y2K. I do really appreciate it, and this is something I did not want to give away in the, the review part. Basically, the movie takes place, I guess, over about a day or so? Yeah, I think it starts, like, very early in, you know... January 31st, 1999, and the very, very end is just like two minutes past. And I, I think it's supposed to be, like, we're supposed to be, like, relieved that, oh, you know, the world didn't end. I think the movie's gone on for too long by then for it to still have the same impact as if just, if you just got, like, 30 minutes out of it, that would, that would help tremendously. And, yeah, so the film definitely does admit that riots are because of racist white cops, but it does not suggest a solution, which, you know, today, many on the left, you know, point out we have to demilitarize the American police, as well as, you know, many of the, the calls that they respond to should be given to people who have who are not looking to escalate a situation, but who are trained in de-escalation. 
you know, because a, a number of the the things that where where it goes really wrong, it's like, well, you know, s someone called because someone is having mental health problems, you know, and and so the cops come and get violent when that's the exact opposite of what you should do in that situation. And you know, it's also important that it's possible to hold people accountable, which right now is not happening in America when it comes to police and many other things. I think this m movies like this and... Ah, uh, hold on. I'll have it momentarily. Ah, crap. What is it called again? Dark Blue you know, really make a strong case that movies like this really should not be made by white people. You know, they should be made by black people. And... Let's see. You know, I'm, I'm not saying you can't make a movie that has black people in it, but if you're going to make a movie that's about race riots, I think we white people have proven we're not great at it. We're, you know, there's just, there's not enough empathy there. There might be a, a an intention of empathy, but when you look at, you know, as I've described in this video, like there's a lot of things that clearly they just didn't understand about black people. And I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert. I'm just, I'm saying things that I've come to understand from watching black YouTubers. You know, obviously, if something I say in this goes against what a black person has said they've actually experienced or they know someone, you know, yeah, obviously they would know better. Yeah, the, the last chunk of the movie is legitimately very tense and suspenseful. So, yeah, um, you know, Mace gets the clip to the captain, and it's this thing of, you know, he seems to not believe him, but then later, you know, he still decided to, to watch it. And Lenny gets to the room, but it's empty, but there's a clip. And we see that Philo has OD'd, and yeah, there's a, a clip of Max having sex with Faith, which looks like rape and you know they make sure to make Lenny look like a pathetic junkie he's like attacking the air around him and you know we're supposed to think that Max is especially awful for having sex with Faith when like I mean apparently it was consensual you know and it also does that thing where <sighs> this was a time when people thought that I mean essentially what they're doing is like s and m you know it's I, I've um, autoerotic asphyxiation is that what it's, it's it's something like that you know it's it's a fetish it's it's fine it's not a bad thing but unfortunately it was something that a lot of the people who did movies about it had no idea so they think oh you know yeah you do the thing and then afterwards you ask did I hurt you and and like Again, I'm not a part of the community. I'm just saying what people in the S and M community have have said that I've you know heard and read. Co like community co communication and consent are huge parts of the the living out the the fetish, you know, and yeah, that. You know, and it's also, like, I am really not a fan of when movies, like, show something that appears to be rape, and then it's like, oh, no, it was, you know, it was, you know, just a, living out a, a sexual fantasy. Like, you could just tell us that going in, because now we're left thinking, oh, well, that's a fucked up way to have sex, instead of just being able to appreciate, oh, it is, you know, some people... Are attracted to that sort of thing so what you're not being forced to take part of it part, part in it you know why do you care uh, you know and and actually if you, you know some some members of the as an community point out the sex that's actually rapey 
tends to be vanilla because people are so anxious about sex they they think that they can't talk about it and especially right before and during maybe after maybe but definitely not before or during and that's when you actually have a lot of things you know crossing a line and some you know survivors of sexual assault and rape you know some just don't feel either either safe or maybe you know, some don't feel that they're allowed to say you know this is crossing a line and then there's of course also sadly a lot where it's intentionally crossing that line but but yeah you know we're supposed to think max is is bad even though it was consensual we're supposed to hate him and want him dead for the fact that he you know had sex with his friend's ex like they're not together right now you know and she she consented to it so it's yeah really really not a fan of how it's you know how the movie is treating that and yeah and and yeah so it's revealed that max is the the killer and he said you could catch a bullet any second so basically you know the anxiety that he feels on account of having been been shot and this trauma made him a villain so you know we basically the three villains in the film you know i i would consider philo gant more of a he's an antagonist but he's not oh hold on actually thinking about it i guess he is responsible for a lot okay so of the four villains three of them are cops two of them current cops you know and all four of them are white so that's you know clearly we are supposed to take away you know hashtag not all cops because the captain is one of the good ones you know and it it, it very much makes the the bad apples argument which i i I had forgotten because conservatives control the conversation so much, but I, I saw someone point out some, some months back, no, but that's not how you're supposed to use that phrase. And, and you know, I'm, I figure that it started as someone pointing out, you know, some of these cops are bad apples, and conservatives went in and said, ah, but it's only those. But no, the saying is, a few bad apples spoils... I guess like the cart or the the whatever the the container of it you know which and that is also that's true you know that's the the literal yeah a few bad apples will you know can spoil the entire thing you know d depending on how much time between them going bad but yeah you know the the movie says you know the the rest of the the cops are good you know they 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 stop beating the black woman as soon as they're told to stop by the captain you know and and they shoot the the bad cop so it's you know in this very like revenge they like you know they're getting uh getting a taste of their own medicine kind of thing and that's supposed to fix things similar to how you know rambo 2 which I acknowledge, you know, Cameron has gone on the record saying, I wrote the action, Stallone wrote the politics, but that movie does a similar thing with the Vietnam War, you know, saying this is how we solve it, when it's not even remotely the, the case. And, but, but yeah, and I, I don't love the idea of like, you know, but yeah, this this was very much a time in Hollywood where if you suffer trauma, you know, in, in a Hollywood movie, you're either, you know, yeah, you're either a hero or you're, you become a villain. You The, the trauma turns you evil. You know, there, there wasn't seen, if, you know, and, and if you're a hero, it's because you're just such a strong individual. It's all about strength of character. Americans are obsessed with strength of character. And the, the 
yeah, that's just not the truth. The the truth is that we, you know, it's a it's something where you need people to understand the pain and do what they can to try to help. It's not about individuals. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, in 127 minutes in, there's 13 minutes left before the year 2000, and yeah, Mace treats the cop duo the way they treat black people, but is then beaten by the other cops. You know, she shoots, and, and there's a, a brawl, the, you know, the riot explodes. There's a, uh, what's the word? Uh, Mace, hold on. Yes, yes, Mace shoots one of the cops with the the taser and yeah you know like other movies about black pain it's about the white man who you know in in the lead who can get redemption instead of you know so, so yeah so that white america can feel good they they can see themselves in in the the white guy who yeah, he made some mistakes, but he's trying, and he's not a racist anymore. You know, in this case, it's not ra it's not not racist anymore. It's not an addict anymore, and not passive, but active. Which in a another thing, America is obsessed with the the you know the will to it's you know training means nothing. The will to act means everything, and just in no way is the problem solved. You know, but the movie acts like no, it was just. It was these two current cops, this one ex-cop, and one club owner who walk into a bar and let's see. Yeah, and and the Yeah, he's he sees yeah, the captain saw the, the clip and he doesn't cover for the cops, but holds them accountable. And the duo dial, and yeah, it's it's very much this thing of you know this idea that if just the right white cops, if if someone high enough up no you know understands, then you know th this idea that they are fundamentally good, that there are you know which I suppose. You know, there are some, but and I forget. I I'm afraid I forget his name. But there's this former Baltimore cop. Um, let's see. Hold on. Um, Michael Wood. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, he, he started speaking out against it and he's hated by other cops. He's not seen as, you know, oh, thank God someone's holding us accountable. You know, like that's ideally you would want someone with power to be glad that there's accountability. If you're not that's a bad sign. It's not necessarily a sign that you yourself are doing something bad, but it probably means that you're gonna hold, you're gonna cover up for the ones who are doing bad, you know. So, yeah, and and I realize, you know, at the time, America was pretty convinced that white cops, at the end of the day, are still there's still more of them that are good than bad. And, you know, today we've seen, like, I mean, no, nothing's preventing them from speaking up. Nothing's preventing them from resigning en masse to demonstrate, you know, we're not going to, if, if, if the police station we work for is racist, we don't want any part of it. You know, we, we are going to do something else. You know, I'm not saying they don't have to resign. I realize that it's difficult to find a job today, but they could, you know, there's there's other options. They could strike, 
you know, they could sign a petition. There's there's so many options, and you're more, you know, you're seeing a lot of the opposite. You're seeing a lot of them, like there there was that one like police commissioner who was like practically screaming about how unfair it is that you know they're being judged for the bad things that they're doing. Now that is it for my notes taken while watching so notes taken before watching right I, I do have one critic quote um, at least one person said the movie would be better if you removed Mace she adds nothing plot wise I think she is probably basically there like honestly a quick rewrite Okay, maybe not quick, but a rewrite, one rewrite, and she's the lead, and the movie's better for it. Like, the fact that Lenny, like, how, how ridiculous is it that people, that all these, you know, so many white Americans would rather watch a pathetic white guy than a competent black woman? And, and sadly, that is, like, you know, some, some of the, when you look at how some stuff, certain movies and shows are received, you know, yeah, a number of people would much rather that they're they're more okay with something that says you're pathetic as a young white American man than something that says you as a white young American man should empathize with people who are different from you that's that is completely unacceptable to them and yeah you know she's hypothetically you could remove her character but I think it would be much more the movie would be so much better if she was made the main character so it is very admirable that the movie wants to increase empathy for African Americans and it's no wonder that the Rodney King beating and the subsequent lack of consequences for the cops inspired this movie it's not the only movie that was inspired by it, but much like Dark Blue, which also, you know, that one is specifically about the Rodney King beating. That one is set in, during the trial, in the lead up to the, yeah. It does ultimately mishandle, you know, both of these movies does do ultimately mishandle this important message. In this film, we are meant to believe that it would do very much good to reveal to the world the truth of police violence when in reality we realize today and again I acknowledge that back then not as much but countless black people realized at the time which is part of the problem with white liberals making this movie instead of black activists getting to it's nowhere near enough to simply reveal the truth it is going to take a much more fundamental shift you know the the it's a it's a problem that so many people have had for a lot of Americans their exposure to law enforcement tends to be based like the the um, they'll watch a lot of propaganda and they'll end up thinking oh you know cops are largely good and even if they themselves have bad experiences with cops a lot of them will say, ah, oh, that was just that one cop, what, whatever. Most of them are still good. You know, so when people who are not white come out and say, almost all of our encounters with law enforcement, you know, are, are really, really, you know, case, cause a lot of, of pain and injury and even death for us, you have a lot of these white people who've been fed this steady stream of propaganda who say, well, I guess you're doing something wrong. Because that's the way it is in a lot of this propaganda. You know, yeah, they will feature some, you know, minorities getting, you know, getting beaten up or getting killed or that kind of thing. But they tend to frame it as, well, they made the wrong decision. You know, maybe not only now, maybe they've also made the wrong decision to not have a job and do drugs and these various things so so it, it, yeah let's see and uh, yeah you know there, there are countless white people who will defend violent cops over the black people 
they brutalized, who often did absolutely nothing wrong. Like, there, you know, there was that video of, uh, I guess by now it's been a few years, but I remember there was a video where, like, the, the black woman in the back of the car who had just had her male partner shot, even though he did nothing wrong, you know, by these white cops, you know, she's sitting there, she's got like a four-year-old that is now fatherless on her lap, and she's being extremely calm. Like, not, she's saying and doing nothing wrong. And a bunch of white people, you know, commented on that saying, she must not really care about her partner, because look how calm she is. You know, you can't win. If you're calm and you still get killed, it's still somehow your fault. If you're, you know, just, yeah. Let's see. Um, and, yeah, you know, sadly, movies like this can lead to people not realizing the scope of the problem. And I'm certain that that wasn't what it was meaning to. I, I'm, you know, I really strongly get the sense that it was trying to say, you know, it's it's bad when this happens, but it ends up saying it was bad this one time that it happened. But it's okay now, you know. Go 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 home and and relax. You're okay. We're all okay. Now, I'm not going to to read aloud, but the in the I'm to be memorable quote section, we see what Jericho one said before he was shot, and that's why this is in this section, because I picked it up doing research, not while watching the movie. But yeah, you know, it really feels like it's acting as though he worsened the situation by being verbally aggressive to the police, and like, that was how they they realized who he was, you know, and and... I, I do appreciate that they do actually, the, the uh, what's the word, the, you know, Jericho won and the, the other guy with him, whose name I is, escaped from me at the moment, not, not because I don't care, I just, you know, sometimes I have a bad memory about these things, uh, you know, they, they point out there's no reason for the cops to pull us over. You know, we were we were going under the speed limit. If we were driving any slower, we'd be parked or even backing up. You know, and and you know, it it does make it clear. And you know, God bless Vincent D'Onofrio. He really, one hundred percent of you know, if, if you ask him to play a despicable character, you know, he will one hundred percent go for it. If if the you know. You know, the, the things that he says right before shooting Jericho 1 do make it clear, you know, 100% some of these cops. You know, the movie apparently thinks it's just these two, but some of these cops are, are really, really hateful. You know, like he doesn't, you know, he, he has a problem with the fact that the the you know that there's this black guy who's you know like he phrases it ah you phrase it phrases it as you want to put the LAPD over a you know rake us over a cheese grate or some, something like that you know but like what he's talking about is accountability you know and that makes him so angry that he shoots him executes him just like that you know but but yeah ultimately you know the I really, I wish, and I think, I think on one hand, it's this idea that black people are more aggressive than white people, which, it, you know, as I've discussed, is incorrect. I think it's also, like, I know that there are some Americans, and I realize, you know, James Cameron's Canadian, but he knows, he's great at appealing to the American id. There's a lot of Americans who think that if you are passive. If, if you don't try to take charge, take control of a situation, that means you're weak. So I think that was also that, you know, 
Cameron was worried that people would think the Jericho one was just weak. And sadly, that's also, like, the, there are a number of, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that all Americans are fascists, but you have a lot of American fascists online saying, you know, like, just the other, no, I'm, I'm not even going to repeat it. But there's, there's a, you know, you have a number of Americans saying, if you don't fight hard enough to prevent something you deserve it happening which is just completely absurd and incredibly toxic idea the the yeah you know this kind of thing can increase victim blaming again white liberals at the time and sadly some still today would say that for white cops to get violent with a black person the black person must have said or done something when in reality, as we now have definitive proof, video recordings proving countless times, there's absolutely nothing that the African-American said or did that at all contributed. The white person saw a black person and got extremely aggressive. I think the movie would be stronger if Jericho was completely complying and it was entirely the white officers who were to blame, you know, that it was impossible to read the movie as saying that Jericho should have handled it better. Let's see, you know, and it, it's the, I, I forget if the, I'm not saying it only happens to, to black people, it does also happen to, it, it happens to white people also. I, I forget if the, if this example is of a white or black, but there, there was, you know, there, there, there's this video, I, was it body cam? I, I forget, but like, the, the cop would basically, he's basically playing Simon Says with this guy, you know, he's like, you know, get, get, you know, get, get on the ground. Okay, now put your, let's see, put your head, put your hands on your head, put, uh, um, and keep them there. Now, pull out your license and registration, something like that. And then when he takes his hands off his head, the cop attacks. I forget if it was fatal. It's It's been years since this, uh, you know, but the the thing that really stuck with me was there was nothing this guy could have done because the, the cop is just creating a situation where he can say, I told him to keep his ha hands on his head. He didn't do it. I felt threatened. I attacked. You know, the the... I'm not saying it's true of all cops, but some clearly, like, they join the force specifically to brutalize people, especially black people. There's a massive problem of, like, white supremacists joining law enforcement and law enforcement refusing to weed them out. And, you know, yeah, they'll just, they're, like... They were they were bullied in high school, or they you know they have some kind of they have some reason they, there's something that's making them angry, and instead of trying to deal with that and maybe like thinking well you know maybe the thing that's making me so angry is some kind of systemic thing that I can try to fix, instead they just find random people to take out their anger on, and it's it's a huge problem in America. It's not only cops. Now, one thing I I think that the movie would be better if you removed the the squid clip element. Like it feels like it's just you know it's it's it works as a drug metaphor, and I I do get that you know it's, they're trying to do this thing of oh you know if you do too many drugs and if you have some kind of psychological trauma you're gonna become a serial killer, you know which was something that they actually that people actually believed at the time the, this is far from the only 90s american movie where someone becomes a serial killer because of some kind of psychological you know yeah but the the i think that the movie would be easier to follow and less cluttered if you remove it entirely like the evidence doesn't require it it could be just a normal pov video like you know, if the movie had been made today, they it probably would have just been like body cam footage, and may, you know maybe the cops, or maybe like you know someone like you know Iris had a body cam for some reason, or or you know some 
yeah, I, I, you know, there's a chance. Like, if it was made today, it might have just been like cell phone. You know, so one of the one of the four people in the car got out their cell phone, and started recording. You know, Irish runs away with the cell phone. You know, and that's it. Like, you could you could remove the entire element, and I I do think there's an interesting element there, but it really doesn't mesh with the the racial justice element at all because Jericho one had nothing to do with you know and, and the white cops they had nothing to do with squid clips at all like it wasn't even you know they, they mentioned oh it was like you know it was originally made as like a wire and that's you know that is essentially what it's used as but you don't need a drug metaphor to sell that you know the 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 fact that Lenny Philo and Max are addicted to, you know, to varying degrees, to, to these squid clips changes nothing for the police brutality element. You know, the... the yeah, it's, I, I really... I, I, I wish that Cameron had written two different movies here. I, I think there is a really interesting movie, and, and a lot of the way this is that movie that explores the the thing of you know what if there was this technology the the squid clip thing and there's definitely there's there's multiple very compelling movies in this thing of like police brutality and and cover up attempts but i don't think they're the same movie and i think you know watching this movie yeah, it, it really feels to me like the movie itself, basically, for, for the reasons that I've gone into in this video, the movie itself basically makes the case against the, the, the combination of, of elements. And I really, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's too bad. Like, you can't remove any sci-fi elements from the original Terminator film, but... You know, this, The Abyss, it's, you know, the Avatar movies, Terminator 2, Aliens, you know, yeah, like, you know, I mentioned I love those films, but, yeah, ultimately you, you could, and, and it does perhaps, I, I do think this is probably the one where it's the worst integrated, like the other ones, it does at least add something to the movie that, is really like that works in the context of the movie uh, more so than than this now um, that's the end of the video uh, I've given a couple of suggestions for reasons to hit me up in the comments if you need one more you know if you have any suggestions for how to rewrite this movie um, yeah I'd love to read them, and yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell, there should be a link to my main channel page, one or two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, one talking about the most recent episode of Ahsoka. And once Ahsoka has, once all of that has hit Disney Plus, I'll start on, the, you know, every, you know, yeah, every other week I'll do an episode of uh, Droids, the eighty-five animated Star Wars show, and the, you know, every other other week I'll do an episode of. Ewoks, the other 85 animated Star Wars show. I also do a weekly video where I talk about the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of The Bear. Same thing for Scream Queens. I do a daily video where I talk about the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Recently, the Review and Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more of this like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time. Bye.